For today's video, we're doing another long format content where I combine my series into long movies. I appreciate you sticking with me while I take a break from YouTube. I just went back to work and I also had a baby and I just need a bit of a break. So that's why I'm also doing this compilation kind of thing. In today's video, we're doing every childhood art kit that I ever finished. This was a very long series. I had a bunch of childhood art kits that I found in my basement. They were very dusty, very old, and they had never been completed. And I set out to complete every single one of them on my channel. I also completed a couple of ones that were sent from you guys to me. They were like art kits that you guys had never finished as kids. And I do still have more of those that I plan on completing, but let's see everything I've done so far. There's a lot. Okay, I'm just gonna introduce them really quickly because I added a bunch of stuff. So this is Glow Explosion Paint by Crayola. This is a bedazzling kit. This is a friendship bracelet kit. It's a how to make your own snowflakes book. This is Rainbow Loom, very popular request. Those like felt coloring kits. A Build-A-Bear slash stitching kit. A latch hook. Hello Kitty rug, a beginner's stitching kit, paint by number, and three like paintable things. Okay, we're starting off with my 15 year old paint by number kit, opening that up, and I chose a dolphin painting. I actually love water animals, and I can make a dolphin noise. It's hidden talent, maybe? I don't know. But so then the next chore was to go through the paint. Some were missing, and they didn't have the right numbers on the bottom. For example, I picked up two yellows. One had like a 23 and a 13 on it, and the box clearly says that yellow should be three. So something was wrong with the numbers. I had to relabel them and kind of make up my own thing, but it worked out fine. So now I had to choose the first color I was going to paint with, possibly red. Nope, green, blue, white. Weird choice would be white. Um, a little indecisive here, but we went with a gray and a white combo and we're gonna start painting. I realized I didn't explain what paint by number is. I kind of just thought everyone would know what that is, but on the off chance you don't know what it is, you've been living under a rock, you know. Um, basically, you have little boxes that have numbers on them, and those numbers correlate to colors. So for example, yellow is three, so anywhere I see a three, I'll put a yellow. Anywhere I see a 14, I'll put a blue, because blue is 14, etc. If you follow me on Instagram, it was around this point that I posted a hint about this week's video. Get ready for the ocean to be filled in now. Nice. As a side note, I'm obsessed with how like aggressively competitive and 80s sounding this song sounds. It's ridiculous. I'm gonna be painting the coral now, which was my favorite part. Oh, we're done. Wow, we're done. Ah, it looks so good. I just painted that with some like Maj Paj thing and wow, I love this. Paint by number's great. So yeah, the spin art system was broken. Basically spin art spins in a circle with a battery. The battery pack, I changed the battery, didn't work, but now I'm just gonna do a paint pour. So I tested it out wrong. At first I decided to just pour it directly on and I realized that I had to mix it with soap and water because it was just not liquidy enough. It was not working out. I don't know what I'm doing. So then I got some little tiny paint things, put some soap in it, mixed it around. I didn't add water, so it's very thick right now. So this first attempt, fail. I mean, honestly, all of these are a fail because I'm doing it on like cardboard paper or like construction paper, which isn't really ideal. You kind of need canvas to do this. So I will do this again, actually. It was a lot of fun. If I had some canvas, I think it would come out better. But yeah, so I poured some things on, moved it around, realized that this was still too thick. I needed some water in the paints. And yeah, it was very messy. I tried blowing on it, which kind of had some cool results. I like the way it came out. It's just, you know, not sure. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. It was very messy. That was the final result for that one. So we're just gonna try to airlift that off there without messing it up. Okay, next one, I mixed some water and I made it more bubbly, as you can see. Ooh, that looks really nice. So like, this is really bubbly so that I would have a cooler effect and it's more liquidy so that you can paint pour and smear it around more. So I did the blue, the pink, and now I'm doing white. I think the white I made a little bit too liquidy, but that's okay. We're living and learning. 
As a side note, the white kind of looks like milk to me, which is really grossing me out in hindsight. Big no. Doing this was a lot of fun because these are just construction paper. Like, if this was a canvas, I would be more upset. But since these are 15-year-old art kits and some construction paper, I could kind of just have some fun with it and do whatever I wanted and know that I wasn't really messing anything up. Because I wasn't really using these construction papers for anything, they're just things that I was doing for fun, it really was very liberating, is basically what I'm saying. I could just do whatever I wanted, because it's not really that big of a deal. It's a piece of construction paper. It's not like I'm messing up something expensive. And we had to airlift this one out of there, too. Oh, gosh. It was, like, really hard to not mess it up, because it's a piece of paper. Really, you need to be doing this on canvas. I mean, it's a piece of paper. And that's the thing about paper. It bends. It bends a lot. So when you're trying to even pick it up, you need to pick it up very carefully. But that was the result. We're moving on. For this one, I had a glitter paint. I am so excited about this. I really liked the glitter paint, and in the moment, this was actually my favorite one that I did. In hindsight, it's actually not my favorite. The one after this will be my favorite, but this came out pretty good in the moment. I was trying to really, like, dive into the abstract process and let go and just move things around and see what happened. And I think I really did that with this one, and I had a lot of fun with the glitter and the blue and the pink. I love blue and pink and white, so that's that's what we did for this one. You can see I'm moving it around. There you go. I like that one. I think it looks really nice. I love those colors. Okay, and now we're gonna do the last one. For this one, I decided to start off with the glitter and the green. Ew. And that bent. Yep, that one bent. Because it's paper, again. We should be doing this on canvas. We can do it again, maybe. I don't know. But... Yeah, okay, so uh, this one did not come out great at first. We will admit that this looks horrible at first, but sometimes our worst mistakes come into our greatest, turn into our greatest feats, I think. So that looks like slime, Nickelodeon slime. So I decided to add some blue because it looked really bad. And then I decided to add some white, I think, on top of that. Yeah. And then I moved that around a bunch. I tried blowing on it a couple of times, which I thought looked cool. This kind of ended up looking like earth, you know? It looks earthy. I added some extra white on top at the end to add some extra special flair. I moved it around, I blew on it a couple more times, and voila, that was the final result right there. I like this one, it looks cool. That looks cool. Okay, so this is the rainbow watercolor kit. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. Basically, you can paint a rainbow all at once in watercolor with this. So that's what I'm doing here. I just figured, let me test it out. Go big or go home. Let's do a rainbow because that's what this is meant for. We're painting with a rainbow. And that looks really nice. I mean, it comes out very blended. It looks cool. And since this is watercolor, and it's on just regular printer paper, I'm not doing anything fancy here, I don't even have watercolor paper, I decided to just use this as a time to just, just have some art for me. You know, this isn't something that's, it's nothing fancy, there's nothing expensive about this, I'm not gonna use this at a later point. In fact, I'm probably just gonna throw this construction paper away. But I figured, let me just have a fun time, express myself. So that's what I'm doing here. I use some like rolly thing. I'm painting some flowers. And I was really just trying out the art kit. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I realize that this is not very sophisticated art. It just looks cool, maybe, to some people. It was just fun to create, is really what it was. And I'm sure if you had this watercolor kit, you'd have a fun time creating stuff. And yeah, that's basically what I did. I just had some fun. And I created some flowers on the bottom. I've been seeing a lot of prints of flowers online, so I was really inspired by that. So I decided to create my own flower print out of watercolors. I just created all different colors of flowers and kind of put them all together and had them layered and added some leaves to the background. And then I colored over the flowers. They had that their, their color in it. I don't know, you can see that. And then the last thing I did was this with the Posca paint pen. I kind of just freehanded this and I let myself just go. I just colored and traced whatever I wanted to trace and kind of just outlined the flowers. And I liked the way this actually came out at the end. I wasn't really stressing about it. I was just letting myself do whatever, whatever came to mind. Whatever scribble I wanted to scribble, I, I scribbled. What? Don't think, just paint or draw. And that was kind of the theme for these two. Some art kits just deserve to be left in the past, and the knitting machine is an example of that. Straight out of 2003, maybe? I don't even know when this is from. 
we're going to put together that and string it up, lace it up right there. It was kind of annoying to put together and lace up, but actually the hardest part was getting it started. So you can just crank that little wheel thing and you're supposed to be able to knit together like a scarf or a hat, basically. But they wouldn't go on the hooks and that was my mistake. I kind of got it jammed in the beginning and I thought it wouldn't matter too much, so I kept going. That was my mistake. I kind of just skipped over that and swirled it all up until... Well, actually, it got pretty long, actually. It did get really long. It got to the point where I was like, wow, I might be able to make a real scarf out of this. It was getting quite long. But that was my mistake, pulling it up like that and pushing it down. Oh. And yeah, so we spun and we spun and we cranked for a while until we got a noise. We got a... Yeah, I had to take it off. It got jammed. It wasn't long enough to be a scarf, but it was long enough to be maybe a leg warmer, or for me, an arm warmer, as I'm displaying here. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna try again with the yarn that's left over. Okay, so this time I decided to take my time and hook each piece individually on the little hook at first so that we could create a perfect knit thing. I was trying to get it as long as I can get it, I would be happy if it was a second arm warmer, I would be happy if I had a scarf, a hat, but unfortunately, we only got this far. This far. Here's how far it gets. Ready, and... Uh, 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 uh. Done. It's done. So this ended up about the size of a scrunchie. Zero out of ten for the knitting machine. I did not like this art kit. Let's leave this one in the past. Uh, this art kit, I, well, it's aggressive. Okay, and I'm opening it aggressively. But, so I got this art kit when I was young. I think it's my sister Alina's, actually. It's at least 10 years old, we'll say that. And I'm struggling to find the garbage. It's to the left, to the left. And off to a great start. These are the paints. They're very, like, big. It's like a Dorito bag when you leave it too long in a closet and then it swells up. So that's how old these paints are. Just because I feel like no one knows what I just said. You know how chip bags get like really swollen when they're old? Like they fill up with air? That's what I was saying about the paints. Anyway, back to the paints. I started shaking them for some reason and I realized some of them are crystals and some of them are liquid. You stir the crystal into the liquid and that's how you activate the glow. So this is the yellow liquid. And this one is the green liquid. Except when I poured it, it was not green. Why is this not green? Maybe it will look green when it's glowing. Also, I spilled that, so that's annoying. But okay, so here I'm mixing in the crystal. We can't really tell what's going on because we are in the light. So I'm just hoping at this point that the, the darkness will bring out the colors. I don't know. This is also a 10-year-old kit, so maybe it just doesn't work anymore. Unclear. So that was supposed to be orange right there, and it's red, and the white was supposed to be blue, and it's white. I don't know what's going on. But I went with this cat. I will say I do have a couple of complaints, and I don't know if they're valid complaints, because again, this is a very old kit. But the crystals didn't really melt or mix well into the liquid. It just kind of sat on top of it, and it was very, like, grainy. And then also this paint was very liquidy. It was, like, very watery, and it did not dry well. But it did glow in the dark. Here it is. Oh, wow! It is glowing! Holy... Wow! I am cringing at the way I said, Whoa! That was my, like, genuine reaction, so I'm embarrassed. But I started to paint the tiger now in the dark because I thought it'd be easier to see what's going on. You can see that the green is glowing the most. The orange is, like, kind of there, but you can't really see it. You see it more on the paintbrush, honestly. I don't know. Everything's very grainy, but it's it's glowing, so... Yeah, not much more to say about that. I feel bad being critical because it is so old, so I'll give it like a 5 out of 10, I guess. What I have to say about this dog, really, is look at it. It's a mess. And there's an ambulance playing outside my house right now. I hope it's getting picked up on the microphone because that is how I feel about this dog. The actual structure of this dog is just a mess. It's just a wreck. It's very chunky, so like no matter how much you paint it, it's just going to come out chunky underneath. There's nothing I could do to save this thing, so I don't know why I even tried. And on top of that, I think it's supposed to be like a, a baby, obviously, because it has like a bib. It's like a baby dog, and I don't know why I put eyebrows right there. The eyebrows look horrible. Ignore those. I, I kept them, sadly. And it also just has like a huge, like, circular nose, very chubby cheeks. I made the eyes look horrifying, but I was going for like a cinnamon apple kind of thing, apple cinnamon dog, or like a, 
you know, like a caramel, apple, apple cinnamon type of deal. That was the theme. Uh, oh, that's so bad. Quite, quite scary. Get away from I'm me! I'm so scared! <laughs> and I filled in the mouth with black, which kind of just made it worse, and I don't know what I was doing. Then I tried to put, like, cinnamon sprinkles powder on the arms and legs, and it looked weird, so then I decided to paint the arms and legs with a brownish color. But this is the final dog. I painted it. I finished the art kit. I think it looks horrible. I'm so sorry. We're gonna move on. This art kit is the Teddy Buddy Creativity for Kids. You build the bear, you stuff it, and then you do stitching on its sweater. So I already actually built the bear. Uh, I stuffed it when I was younger. One of them is my sister's, and I think, I guess she tried stitching on this sweater. It didn't come out great. So I never stitched my sweater, so we're gonna do that. We have this little, like, stitching circle. Just googled it. It's called a cross-stitch hoop. Learning. Uh, so you just stick that inside the sweater and then close it up. Once that is secured, you just want to thread the embroidery thread through your little sewing needle and kind of just do whatever you want. I decided to start off with a flower because I thought that might be easier to start off with since I'd never stitched anything before and it was still quite hard. I was trying to make it look like the flower was tilting forward so I made the top petals bigger than the bottom ones. I don't know if that came across or it just looked like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Nodding it in the back and then I'm moving on to the stem. And I don't know, I guess this art kit was very hard for me. I don't know why. I don't know if it was because the sweater had such big holes in it so like you couldn't really tell where your thread was going to go. I've also never done embroidery before so it, that might also be part of it. I do think that this kit is really good if you want to learn embroidery and also you want a stuffed bear. This is totally the kit for you, you know. Uh, up here I decided to do a B. I wonder where I got my inspiration from for this. Certainly didn't come from the box. Nope. I made that up by myself, guys. Uh, so yeah, I, I, did, I did the B because, I don't know, I thought the B looked easy. I, I really was just trying to go for easy things at this point. I think you guys can probably tell, I just was not a very big fan of this kit. I don't know what it was, I just found it quite boring and annoying and hard. That's all I found it. Uh, so he, besides the part that you get a bear, I mean, the, the, the bear is fun, except when you look at the outside of the box, Look at the outside of the box and you think you're getting this. You think you're getting this beautiful bear and then you get this. That horrifying anteater of a bear. I don't know. I'm gonna give this like a 3 out of 10. This art kit I'm actually very excited to do. I used to love these when I was little, so I have a bunch of these already done. I didn't do the horse and the dolphins, but everything else is basically done. I have this love one. I have a Pooh Bear one. I loved Pooh Bear growing up, so that's why I have Pooh Bear and Piglet right there. Um, behind that I think is a Celtic cross, so we do have a bunch of them already completed. I decided to go with this horse. I just had to google what it was called. I kept thinking of merry-go-round and I was like, this is not what it's called! It's called a carousel. I don't know why that was not coming to me. I could not think of the word. Wait, no, I'm wrong. Okay, so you can call it a merry-go-round or a carousel. They are the same thing. Don't want to lead people astray here. I went with like a coral, like salmon color for the color of the horse and I almost immediately regretted it. I don't know why I went with that color. I think at the end it looks fine, but initially painting that horse this weird flesh color just, it didn't sit right with my soul, you know? Mm -mm, I don't like that. I looked at it and I was like, oh, I wish I could change it. But that's the thing about markers. You can't go back once you do marker. And that's why I don't really like markers. I don't like to color with them because I, I just feel like they always come out streaky and I can't change it. And for some reason, my right hand always smears it. And that is what happened here. If you look directly in the center of the horse, you will see a small smudge. Just a very, a very tiny, tiny smudge of gray right on the horse. And that is haunting me. <laughs> But I think this came out good, and it honestly, it did change my opinion maybe a tiny bit about markers. Besides that one smudge right there. The smudging never, it never stops, the smudging. But maybe I'll try some markers in my Create This Book. Oh! Don't! Don't drop! Let me just give you a quick overview of all of the options we have here. This is a paintable lamp. This is a friendship bracelet kit. Two Care Bear paintables. A bedazzling kit, a beginner's stitching kit, a felt uh, marker thing, rainbow loom, stained glass, 
painting things and paint by number. So this is a creativity for kids art kit. The kit comes with various materials to decorate the lamp. We have some yarn, not enough paint, a light bulb, and some fabric glue, as well as the actual lamp. I took out some blue masking tape that matches the background perfectly. And now we're ready for some paints. These are my neon paints that I just got. Each of these colors are really bright and vibrant. I also mixed together an aquamarine color with some white to make a light aquamarine color that we will use later. First, we're painting the lampshade. Because this paint is neon, it is very bright. So bright, in fact, that some might even say the paint is glowing. The art kit itself actually had groovy ceramic lamp written on the front of it, and that made me think of lava lamps. For those of you who don't know what a lava lamp is, well, it's, it's a lamp filled with glowing liquid. So you turn your lamp on and there's some colorful liquid in it that's floating around and looks quite slimy. So I decided to have lava lamp liquid drip down the sides of the lampshade. After painting the first coat of the neon paint and kind of figuring out where I wanted the drips to be, I took out my aquamarine paint. I decided to use this color for the background of the lamp. So you might be asking yourself, hey, Marissa, why didn't you paint your blue background before you put the drips? And while I will admit that usually I will not have a very good answer for these kinds of questions, this time is different. I intentionally put the drips first because the neon paint is actually transparent and you really need to paint it on a white background so that it can be as bright as possible. I used the transparent nature to this paint to my advantage and created a glowing outline as well as some shading to make the drips look very three-dimensional. I also took a lighter version of each color and added it to the center of each of the drips. This step was actually a little annoying because I already felt like I blended everything out and then I felt like I had to do it again, so... Although this step was admittedly pretty time consuming, I think it did increase the quality of the painting and it really made these drips look more like glowing lava lamp drips. I took out my white paint pen and added some highlights to each of the drips. Here's what the top of the lamp looks like so far. And now we're ready to add a protective coating to the lamp. Guys, I opened the lid and this had dried on top of it. I love it. It felt like slime basically and was really stretchy so I pulled it until it broke. This is my favorite. After that, I added the decoupage to the lampshade. If you don't know what decoupage is, it's the same as Mod Podge. Once that had dried, I took out the pink yarn. The fabric glue had dried out, surprise, surprise, but I had some hot glue that I used instead. <laughs> While I'm hot gluing the yarn on, I'd like to briefly call your attention to the shriveled up part of the lampshade. <laughs> the paint did not do well there. The other parts of the shade did not shrivel, which was nice, but yeah, that one edge was very wrinkly. I added my signature and now the lampshade is done. Let's move on to the bottom of the lamp. Here is the first coat going on. Beautiful, beautiful, ah. So you'll notice I decided to paint the whole lamp blue, dry it off, before I really had a plan. I took out my planning sketchbook to come up with an idea for what I would actually be painting on the bottom part of the lamp. I'm a big fan of derpy faces, so I thought it would be funny if we had little balls of lava poking each other. I sketched these characters on the bottom of the lamp and then also painted white on each of the areas so that the neon transparent paint would really shine through brightly. Up first, the liquid we decided to paint was pink and then orange and then yellow and then green. I went in rainbow order, okay? So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. I'm just noticing this now, but I think I forgot to do the ombre on yellow and green. All the other lava people have ombres. I truly have no explanation for you other than I wish I realized sooner. 
After that, I added cute little smiley faces to each of these lava people. They're poking each other, which I just find hilarious. They're each just like, touch. I also added little glimmers to their eyes. Usually I don't do that for this kind of face, but I thought it looked cute on this one. Lastly, I took out my gloss decoupage and coated the whole lamp with it. Added the light, added the lamp shade to the lamp, and here's what the final thing turned out looking like. Now I have painted a lamp before, and last time you guys were a little upset I did not turn the lamp on. I turned this one on and Gosh, I wish I hadn't. It really doesn't look good when it's turned on. This one does actually look good turned on. I just forgot to film it last time. So here it is for the people that asked. And here are both of my lamps together. Let's move on to the next art kit. All right, next art kit is going to be... We gotta do Rainbow Loom. I'm not very good at Rainbow Loom, I'll be honest. At the very least, I know I can make a bracelet. Let's do it. Okay, so taking out what is actually my sister Alina's Rainbow Loom kit, she is the one that used to use this. I bought this extra kit because I needed this thing to try to do it. I've definitely used Rainbow Loom before, but I just never remember liking it that much. I decided to try on all of the bracelets that my sister Alina made in the past. Nice job, Lena. I decided to start off easy and try this bracelet, which I have a direct tutorial for. I was following it, I thought I was doing a good job, but I quickly realized that I had no idea what I was doing. I don't know how to do this. So I asked my sister Alina for some help. What am I doing? I'm confused what step you're on. I was on this step. Oh, you're on step one. <laughs> I was looking at it upside down. You take this one. Like that? How, I don't even know how I just That's did that. Correct. With Alina's guidance, I continued onward trying to make my bracelet. Spoiler alert, it did not go very well. At the very least, I know I can make a bracelet. Everything fell apart, so Alina had her foot on the table, I don't know why. This is my third attempt, and I asked my sister Alina for help one more time. This is supposed to be... Oh. <laughs> I can't do this! Rainbow Loom is the worst! Okay, so this is what I ended up with for the bracelet. I decided to just leave it as is, tie a knot, and put it on my wrist just like this. So this is what I ended up with, and I'm gonna try now to make an animal. For this Rainbow Loom attempt, I decided to follow a video tutorial. And I have to say, the video helped so much, and this went so much better. I'm putting things on random holes. I am going to link the tutorial that I actually watched, because this is nearly impossible to follow. I'm not positive I did it 100% correctly, but I tried my absolute best. Those are the eyes that I just put on, those black things right there. And I'm taking off what is now going to be the head to a duck. I'm stuffing the head, adding a beak. Do not ask me how I did this. I was really just intently watching a video tutorial and trying my best not to mess it up because I had such a terrible experience with the bracelet. As I'm sure you can probably tell, the duck went so much better. I stuffed it in the butt right there. <laughs> and then here it is. I mean, that looks like a duck. Don't get it twisted. I definitely hate Rainbow Loom after this experience, but I mean, that, that kind of looks like a duck. Uh, maybe a little bit of an ugly duckling, but it's better than I thought he would be. Okay, so here is our very tall felt coloring page, I guess you could call it. There's a lot of dolphins and sea creatures in here. To get the full childhood experience, we are going to be using Crayola markers. Not this one. It's That is disgusting. Because these markers are quite old, I did take a separate piece of paper and test out which markers were dried out and which were not dried out. Luckily, I had already kind of been through this process when I did my Art Room Makeover series. Some of them were dried out, like this blue. On the whole, though, I do have to say, for markers that are between 15 and 20 years old, they do work pretty well. I did have to resort to the colorific purple marker, and we had a scented brown marker that smells like cinnamon. <laughs> you smell that? I'll stop. I started off with coral reef, which is oddly fitting for the piece. I quickly realized that just using coral reef would be a bit boring, so I switched to every color of the rainbow. A little predictable, but I did have good reason for this. 
it is true that recently Crayola has come out with more shades for their markers. I know they released a pastel pack and I also know they released a skin tone pack. However, with the exception of the light blue and coral reef colors, I pretty much just had the basic old school pack of Crayola markers. The color range is limited and there's really only one shade per color in those packs. As a result, I felt like the whole piece would have way more depth if I made the background rainbow and then focused on the dolphins. So after finishing up coloring in the random little fishies, I moved on to the big fish, the dolphin. Actually, dolphins are not fish. They're actually mammals, right? Because they breathe air and then they go underwater. They can hold their breath for two minutes, wild. And here is what the final thing turned out looking like. I am very happy with this. I'm actually shocked that it actually came out looking okay. I thought it was gonna look really bad since I used so much rainbow in the background, but I think it just looks fun and colorful. Let's move on. All right, taking out my bedazzling kit. There's a bunch of stuff in this bag. I don't know the name for any of this stuff, but if you don't know what bedazzling is, basically you take these two tools and these metal things. I really struggled getting these metal things into the pushy thing, but when I finally did, I tested it out on a napkin. So you push down and on the back, there's supposed to be a jewel right there in the clasp. Here is my new pack of jewels. I opened those up. Get out of the package, please. I selected a pink jewel for my trial run. This is so hard to get the metal thing in the pushy thing. It's hard to see because they're the same color, but the jewel is in the tray. It fell out because this is impossible. But I tried it now with the napkin. I pressed down and the jewel is indeed inside the metal clasp. I will now attempt this on a skirt. The kit did come with a lot of stencils. I chose the star stencil for the back left pocket, dumping some jewels into my hand, and we are going to be sorting through this. I decided to go with pink, silver, and light pink, and I also added in a dark purple after the fact. And now for the bedazzling process, i.e. the most annoying thing ever. I quickly discovered that bedazzling is much harder than I thought. The first attempt was a fail. In hindsight, I have no idea how, but on my second attempt, I did get the pink to stick in. The problem is you have to make a whole star. And the second jewel in this star arrangement gave me so many issues. Only one clasp attached there. I tried again, put my jewel down, pressed, and it fell off yet again. Again, I attempted to stick this on. I tried again, and it just was not working for me. <laughs> Instead of struggling, I decided to give up and move on to tacky glue. Yes, I realize that this is not bedazzling. I am in fact just gluing jewels at this point, but the effect is the same and it's much quicker. After fabric gluing the star on the pocket, I had to get more of those colors together. And this was honestly the most annoying process to pick out all these tiny jewels. And then I glued them to this back pocket using some more fabric paint. I will now present my thoughts on this kit. Upon a first glance, I did not have any bad feelings about this art kit. I didn't remember any bad experience with it. But after I started using it, all of the bad memories started rushing back. I remember being so frustrated as a kid using this art kit and I asked my mom and she said, oh yeah, you hated this art kit. You tried over and over and you never were successful with it. The truth is that some of these art kits in this big pile of things I haven't finished were not finished for a good reason. Some of these art kits deserve to be left in the past where childhood Marissa rejected them. That being said, I don't wanna be so negative about bedazzling kits because I know there are kits out there that are easy to use and people love. I think I just have a really bad one. Okay, so here is my box of Spirograph, uh, the classic way to create countless amazing designs. Age is eight plus, so I should be able to do this. Opening the box and we're taking out our supplies. They give us some paper and all of these little circle things that match the bag. 
background, so you can't really see them. There are also some markers. This is future Marissa speaking. They don't work very well. I was confused by the putty, but the instructions cleared that up. The instructions call this stuff spiro putty. You stick it to the circle and then stick that to the paper and then your circle doesn't move. Here are some options. I don't really like looking at that. So we're just gonna test something out to see if we can make anything at all. This is just a test run. Yep, okay. Looks bad. And now to try this in, wreck this journal. There is a page that says, roll the journal down a hill. Roll, rolling in that circle. Eh, similar enough. I don't know. I didn't want to waste the artwork and put it on a random piece of paper that I would lose. So I thought, let me put it in wreck this journal since wreck this journal is technically meant to be destroyed. So that looks like poop. I think we're on the right track here. Let's try that again. You can probably tell where this is going. My mistake with Spirograph was that I did not read the directions. I'm not typically someone that likes to read directions and I can usually kind of figure it out and be successful. But Spirograph, no, 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 no. Spirograph is not the type of thing you can get by without reading the instructions, in my opinion. What I failed to realize, really, was that Spirograph has all these different circles that have numbers on them. Like, there's literally numbers all over them, and it's very mathematical. You really have to choose what hole you're putting these things in very carefully. Like, every single different hole on this wheel will literally result in a different pattern, and I just didn't realize it. So you really have to look at the manual and see, okay, what am I making here with this number? Oh, okay, this is wheel number 52. If I put them in this, 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 and this hole, it'll make this pattern. I tried following the directions on this one, and I think I just did it wrong. General takeaway is the directions in Spirograph are very important. I will fix this mess in my next Reckless Journal episode. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The water bottle strikes again. <laughs> There's more. We went through the game closet, and in the game closet, I discovered a lot more stuff. This thing is so dusty. Look at this. Dust. Let me just introduce everything so we all know what's on the table. We have these stained glass things, a friendship bracelet kit, and another friendship bracelet kit. So we're just gonna like combine these. A beginner stitching kit. I don't know where the Care Bears are. I didn't want to paint them, but I mean, they just left. So one more paint by number. Oh no, don't drop, don't fall, don't, don't. Ah! The beginner's pottery wheel. <laughs> Is this on? We have a CSI impression kit on the scene of a crime. We also have another CSI kit for fingerprints. And we have a mega science lab crystal growing kit. Let me decide what do we want to do. I want to do this. It looks like it might be boring or it looks like it might be impossibly hard. Let's try it. Okay, so here is the box. It looks like my camera is very blurry, but after cleaning it, I realized it was just the dust. How fun. So this is the Beginner Stitchery Deluxe Set. Weird name. So a door critter. I'm assuming this is the critter. Create a needle point picture, a cross stitch picture, a cross needle point, I don't know. Create five stitchery projects. One, two, three, four, five. We've got sewing, needle point, and cross stitch. I don't know what this is and I would never refer to it as a stitchery project, but here it is. Also, I just wanted to point out these horrifying projects on the bottom. What is that? All right, now that we've inspected the outside of the box, let's open it up and look at the contents. We have the frog, the cross stitch, the needle point, the picture frame, and the keychain. Everything seems to be here. We also have a very large ball of yarn for our stitchery. I took out the directions. Uh-oh. If you know me, you know that I don't really like directions. I feel like they limit my creativity and also somehow make me feel less smart for having to actually read instructions. I would rather just figure it out. To me, the directions almost feel like cheating because they're telling me exactly how to do it. I'm not really figuring it out. You don't know real joy until you ignore directions and then get it right anyway. Pure bliss. 
so I did briefly glance at the directions before pushing it to the side. And from what it said, it said that I should go right to left. Only stitching from right to left didn't really make any sense to me because then you have to keep cutting the yarn and switching colors. So instead, I decided to ignore those directions and go in any order that I wanted. Chaos. I went around in a heart-shaped pattern and I stitched as best as I could. If anyone here knows how to do needle pointing, I know this is probably incorrect. For what it's worth, I absolutely hated the result of this little craft. This keychain is bad, but I tried my best and we're gonna move on to the frog. The thing I really wanted to do. Either me or one of my three other siblings did start this craft kit as a kid. I don't remember doing it, but it could have very well been me. We've got some googly eyes, love those. And some pieces of paper that let people know your current status. My room is a mess, guys. Don't really think I need that to be a message since that's kind of always the case. Although I don't know how to do cross stitching or needlepoint, I actually do know how to sew. I used to take sewing lessons when I was younger for like two years straight every week. I would go to sewing class. I used to like sew my own outfits in fifth grade and wear them. It was a whole thing. My sewing lessons were primarily involving an actual sewing machine, but I do also know how to sew and stitch things by hand. One of my first projects when I was little was actually a hand-sewn stuffed animal. I could probably insert a video of it. I actually have this little handmade bear in my studio right now just because I like it a lot and it was one of my first arts and crafts projects as a kid. I love sewing. I used to do sewing projects on my channel and I'm glad I did this kit because it kind of reminded me of that. I took out my very disgusting hot glue gun, and while it was heating up, I messed around with the facial expressions on the frog, trying to get the best expression we could possibly land on. Perfect. Now that my hot glue gun is actually hot, I can glue the two medium-sized eyeballs on, as well as the mouth. I did decide to make the mouth a sad frown, and then I also decided to make the eyebrows Sad. I was originally gonna do an angry frog, but then I remembered Pepe. Our sad froggy me me me. I felt like Pepe was missing something to cheer him up, so I decided to make a pink bow, cut off the little pieces so that everything was even, and then glued it to the top right part of the head. I liked this bow so much that I decided to make a second bow, because why not? I have so much yarn. And then I glued that to the heart. I guess this frog is no longer Pepe, but rather Paprika. I don't like this keychain at all. I think it turned out really terrible. So we're gonna move that out of the shot. And here is the final door hanger, Paprika. Our little froggy door critter. I actually really love her, especially when she's hanging on the door. This is just delightful. What a fun craft. Let's move on to the next one. Up next, we will choose this. We're gonna try to grow some crystals, guys. I feel like this one won't work because it's so old and it's so much dust on it. It's making me like, have it like, <sighs> I'm gonna have like an asthma attack from this. Get this away from me. And into my workspace. So here we have the mega science lab, which of course I am going to clean off to begin with. This one was the dirtiest of all of them. Get this away from me. Before we get some complainers in the comments, I do realize that this kit is not actually a craft kit. It's more of a science kit. It literally says science lab on it. But a lot of art kits actually exist for crystal growing. And that is why I decided to keep it in the pile. I also may have kept it in the pile just because I read crystal growing and immediately ignored everything else. Which was kind of a mistake on my part, because it involved a lot of science materials, like a microscope, a measuring cup, I don't know what this is, some tweezers, a rock, sand and plaster, a map about clouds, a weather kit, which I have no idea how to use, and the periodic table of elements. But here it is, the crystal growing thing. It's apparently very dangerous. You can't get it in your eyes or on your skin. 
I opened up this dangerous package and discovered it's a Cheeto color. Since the package said this could burn your retinas and skin, I got my safety materials out. I also took out the crystal growing vessel, as well as the vessel's plastic lid. You'll notice on this one I very meticulously followed the instructions. Whenever danger is involved, I do make sure to read the directions. One time on this channel, I almost blinded my left eye because I got acrylic spray in it. I got acrylic spray in my left eye. It was a whole thing, and although I hate reading instructions because it actually crushes my soul to do so, I will read and follow instructions when safety is involved. The other thing is my eyes are just very large and no matter what safety goggles I wear, I always get something in my eye. So now I wear swimming goggles because they have a nice suction seal. You can't tell, but this water is boiling. It's very hot. I mixed together the crystals until it melted like the directions told me to. After I had sufficiently mixed this, I added the rocks to it. I was told in the directions that you had to put the rocks at the bottom and kind of like mush everything around. I made sure to wash my hands off several times in this process. I don't know if you can tell based on the way I've been describing things, but when it comes to science lab type of things, I've never been very good at those. The directions told me to put this in a spot no one would touch it, so I put it with my plants and let it sit for 24 hours before even checking on it. I looked at it and it looked exactly the same. I mean, maybe there were tiny crystals, but nothing like the picture. I let it sit for four more days. I realized that all the crystals had hardened on the bottom in like a sheet, which is not how this is supposed to be. I think maybe it's either the kit is too old, it's like 20 years old, so I don't know if that actually ruined something, or I just did it wrong. Either way, I'm gonna have to say this was a fail, and I don't like the other stuff in the kit, so we're gonna move on. I think this one's gonna be fun and easy. Sometimes the ones I think are easy are really hard, though, so... <laughs> okay, so here we have the three stained glass art kits. I know that this came in an art kit box at first, but I think I lost that box somewhere along the way. So we're going to be using Elmer's clear glue along with some Angelus leather paint. I've seen people use Elmer's glue for stained glass art, but I've never seen anyone mix Angelus leather paint in. It ended up working out like fine, I guess. I really just wanted to try out my neon paints. Wow, they are bright. And they work really well with the colors that are already on this stained glass. One of the hardest parts of doing finishing childhood art kits as a series is just that all of the art kits are so old and they're often missing a lot of pieces. So for this kit, I didn't have any of the paint, obviously, and I wasn't really quite sure how this was gonna turn out when it dried. It's also kind of weird to try to finish art kits you didn't like when you were a kid, because basically if I didn't finish it, it meant that I didn't like it or found it difficult in some way. And as an adult, I usually find those same art kits to be very frustrating. I don't know how to do this. However, this art kit was very nice. I always enjoy the art kits that are kind of just like, almost like coloring pages. For example, stained glass art paint by number, felt art. All of those art kits are usually very simple, but they're also very fun. I liked them as a kid. I like them as an adult. They are truly the craft for all ages. I tried to get a little creative here with the sky and added in some white as well as some like blue to the clouds and swirled it around. Fancy. Now you might be questioning, well, if you mix together all your own paint colors, why didn't you mix together realistic colors, Marissa? Why did you paint your dog a neon green color? I am not sure if this was an actual Lisa Frank kit or not, but it was giving me very Lisa Frank vibes and I just wanted to go with some bright colors. I don't really have a good answer for you other than I felt like it. <laughs> Once I was finished up with this larger stained glass thing, I took out the very small puppy and decided to just quickly fill it in with random colors that I had left over. I also did the puppy paw because it's small and cute. This is so cute. 
And here we have the final result of the puppies. I think they're very cute, but I will say using Angela's leather paint, I think is probably not the best option for stained glass art. It looks fine and it is see-through, but it started to peel just a tiny bit for me. I've seen other people online using regular acrylic paint or food coloring with clear glue. So maybe in the future, I'll try that. Oh no, I actually found the Care Bears. And ow, you guys literally saved my life. Ugh. These two, I never did these. And it's actually great news because they have asbestos in it. Sometimes when we finish childhood art kits, we realize eh, some of them are missing pieces. Some of them were just impossible to do for an adult, let alone a child. Ooh. And some of them are literally poisonous. Okay, so here we have the Totally Me Deluxe Pottery Wheel. Sculpt and paint your own pottery. It's a very large box. I initially tried to film the box like this and it just didn't even fit in the shot. Onto the back of the box, you can see we have a sculpting area as well as a little mouse you can press with your foot. How fun. All right, let's open this box up and see what we have inside. There's barely any clay left in the kit and it has hardened into sand. Not surprising, honestly, but it is really fun to crush. The provided paint pots have also shriveled up into nothingness, but that's okay, I never liked those anyway. You wanna fight? Yeah. Okay. This circle appears to fit right there. Okay, perfect. And it spins. The batteries must still be working. <laughs> Applause, please. These plastic utensils, I'm assuming are supposed to help you mold the clay. I didn't actually use them, except this octopus, I did use that. Since the clay that came with the kit was all dried out, I decided to use my Crayola Air Dry clay. I have been using this in a lot of my clay videos recently and I really like it. I find it easy to use and mold. I started off by using the weird octopus cylinder thing because the directions said to. It didn't really work very well and I ended up just using my hands. I also got some water and wet the clay so that it was nice and soft and could be molded using a wheel. This is me using the wheel. It was actually a lot of fun, but I did find it quite hard to control what I was doing. I don't know if this is realistic to an actual pottery wheel, but it seems like it is. For the majority of the time, I really tried to just use the spinning motion of the wheel to mold the clay. I ended up with this beauty. I let it air dry, and in the morning I dipped into some blue paint and began painting my little tiny vase. This is admittedly a very small thing that I have created here. The kit is for children and thus the results are going to be child sized. Because the blue background is a very subtle ombre, I did make a very subtle ombre with the flowers as well, putting white flowers towards the top of the vase and darker flowers towards the bottom. I took out my clear Mod Podge. This has a very glossy finish and sprayed that outside. And here we have the final result for the vase. I really like the way this one turned out. I think it's cute, it's small, which to me is always an added bonus. Is it a masterpiece? No, but it does prove that this clay pottery wheel is a usable object. So usable that I thought, you know what, let me make something else. So I took out some more clay. I molded it into roughly a, oh wait, no, I did wa- I spilt, I spilt water everywhere. My clay ended up being like sopping wet. Initially this worked really well. I was like, oh yeah, let me mold it into a cylinder. Let me put a little hole in the center. Let me go crazy. Let's make a bowl. So I start molding. I'm having a great time. I'm like, wow, this is looking like a bowl. And as I kept going, this, bowl started to turn into a tray and then maybe even a plate. The clay was just so wet that it could not maintain a form. So I let it dry overnight. 
took out my purple paint and this is what we ended up with. It was kind of like a tray almost. I mean, we're lucky it even has any edges at all at this rate, but that's okay. I am embracing the tiny jewelry tray. I've decided to paint it this very royal neon purple color. It's honestly oddly similar to Barney's color. Anyway, so I took out my Posca paint pens, including a gold Posca paint pen, and decided to paint a heart with a bow and arrow. And then I got a little carried away. I started to add more and more gold to this thing. I did a gold rim around the outside. I added some more bow and arrows inside the tray. I even added some little dots everywhere. Because my clay had been so wet, the rim of my tray was very uneven, and because of that, I decided to make gold drips around the outside to kind of make it look like it was on purpose, but we all know it was not on purpose. I sprayed it with some Mod Podge that has a glossy finish, and here we have the final result for my very small jewelry tray that I imagine will hold things like rings and earrings which is kind of fun. I really like the design, actually. Purple and gold are one of my favorite color combos. I think they're really pretty together. And here we have both of the clay things that I created. They don't really go together, but these are them. Let's move on to the next art kit. Who's that coming from somewhere up in the sky, moving fast as a firefly? It's the Care Bear Countdown, guys. My sister and I used to love the Care Bears. My mom would go on eBay and buy a bunch of like 80s Care Bear collectible things for us because it was cheap and we were like obsessed with it. If my memory serves me right, and it probably does not because I was a child, but I think in the late 90s slash early 2000s, the Care Bears were not nearly as popular as they were in the 80s, which is why you had to resort to eBay to get like the really good collectible Care Bear stuff. The deep cuts. We had the VHS tapes from the 80s, the stuffed animals, I think were probably from the actual early 2000s, and then a lot of 80s figurines. Most of them were already painted, but I guess there were some that were unpainted, and that is what you're looking at right now. For this first purpley pink Care Bear, I decided to add to the stomach a shooting star. If you're familiar with the actual Care Bears and not this weird Care Bear that I'm creating right here, there is a Care Bear called Wish Bear that does have a shooting star on her stomach. This is different because Wish Bear is turquoise and her shooting star is yellow. Just wanted to point that out in case anyone cared. Probably no one except the Care Bears. Okay, once I was done painting this Care Bear, I took it outside and sprayed it with a glossy Mod Podge to make sure it was nice and shiny. And here we have our first Care Bear. I really like the way it turned out, and I really like the glossy coating that I added with the Mod Podge. I feel like this makes it look a lot more fun. Let's paint the other Care Bear. This Care Bear is standing up and has a yellow stomach already. I did decide to just paint over that, make it all white, and start from scratch. I mixed together a light blue color, and as I was painting it, I said, you know what, this would go really great with a cloud. And then I remembered Grumpy Bear. I remember thinking Grumpy Bear was really annoying because he never wanted to do anything. But, if you remember, Grumpy Bear could create clouds. I'm sorry, but that power alone is really cool. I think Grumpy Bear actually had like a rain cloud on his stomach now that I'm thinking about it. So maybe this is the opposite of Grumpy Bear. Maybe this is Happy Bear. Who knows? And here we have both of the Care Bears that I have painted. We have a purple shooting star Care Bear that is not to be confused with Wish Bear. They are two different things. And a weird version of Grumpy Bear that I might want to call Happy Bear. Let's move on to the next kit. The Jelly Friendship Fashions Imagination Friendship Bracelet Kit. Okay, so here we have the Jelly Friendship Fashions Imagination Friendship Kit. <coughs> That's a lot of words, honey. On the box, we've got a bunch of different kinds of bracelets that are quite unrealistic for what you can actually create. 
Inside the box, we have two barrettes and a headband, a pack of beads, some bobby pins, and the yarn. Everything appears to be here. The instructions come with a ruler that I will not be using, but it was nice of them. I will actually be using the inside because I quickly realized that I did not remember anything from my childhood. I used to make these friendship bracelets all of the time. And I remember really liking it. I used to have like a box of them and I would do all different kinds and I just, I can't remember anything. And it turns out it's a lot harder than I recalled it being. I remember having a grand old time creating these friendship bracelets. I seriously felt like it was very relaxing and calming. I remember giving them to people. No. This time I felt very stressed. I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. I felt like it was turning out terrible and it felt like a waste of my time. So apparently times have changed and I now hate friendship bracelets. Who knew? I was attempting to create one of the V's that this little girl apparently created very easily. I thought mine was turning out so bad that I threw in the towel early and just decided to put it on my wrist. It looks so bad. Everyone close your eyes. It's, it's just, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. I'm gonna try again. This time I've chosen orange and yellow, the color of the sun, roughly, or Cheetos. It always reminds me of Cheetos. Um, anyway, so I took out this barrette and I decided, you know what, let me create something that decorates the barrette. On the front of the box, the tiny child makes it seem like one of these little braids are going to cover the barrette entirely and we will look like we've created a store-bought barrette. I decided to go with the macrame braid because it seemed to be a thicker braid. However, as I began actually knotting this, I realized that no, it was not thick enough to cover the barrette at all. I will say that this braid was much easier to create than the V that I had started with. So far, I have created two things with this kit and I hate both of them, but I will try one more time. I took out a blue and a royal purple yarn. They look basically the same color on camera, which is very upsetting to me because in person they look totally different. But right now it just looks like I am creating a macrame braid with two black pieces of yarn. Because of that, I'm gonna skip ahead and show you the results. I ended up with a bracelet that had a little star on it. Here you can kind of see the color a little bit more. It is a royal blue and a purple. Overall, I hate the results for all three of these. They are just not the best, and I think the box made it look like it was way easier than it actually was. Hats off to you if you like making friendship bracelets. I know I used to, but now I cannot. We are going to be doing friendship bracelets again. Okay, so here we have my very large pack of embroidery thread. I like to call it thin yarn. I own a ton of this stuff because I used to love making friendship bracelets as a kid. Oh, how times have changed. I do have a friendship bracelet book that must have come with some kit and it is actually very helpful. As it turns out, there are way more friendship bracelets than I even knew existed. For example, the snake bracelet, you need five different shades ranging from dark to light. I chose these colors and I realized they're not actually arranged from dark to light, but I like these colors a lot. So I decided to rearrange them. And when I looked at it, I said, you know what? No. The blue needs to be next to the blue. So that is the order we are going to go with. Hopefully it doesn't mess anything up. I started off by pulling all the yarn out and then I realized I didn't know how long it should be. Is it in the book? No. So I'm gonna take a guess. My wedding is quickly approaching and my nails are very long on purpose. This makes it very difficult to handle thin yarn. My fingernails are too long, but I persisted. And then I began the process of tying a million more knots. I had the book open in front of me and I was trying to follow the directions very closely, 
every single step, I would look at the directions and make sure I was tying the right knot. However, around halfway through, I started to realize that I made a big mistake. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I made a mistake because this did not look like a snake. See what I did there? I rhymed mistake with snake, which is exactly how I feel about this piece. This was a big Miss Snake. I should have chosen something that was a little bit simpler. It looks kind of correct, but also kind of not correct. Like, you can see that it is snaking a bit like an S, but also it's not quite right. I need to figure out what to do with my embroidery thread because friendship bracelets is not it. Okay, so here we have the paint by number canvas. It has a lot of little tiny sections that are labeled with numbers. The kit also comes with a bunch of paints that have numbers on them. The numbers correlate to the sections on the painting. I think we all know how paint by number works. Surprisingly, the paint was still wet. This is at least 15 years old, so I'm shocked. I also wanted to point out that when there's a fraction, you mix those two colors together. The first color I chose was green. I think this is number seven. I just chose this pretty randomly. I was like, you know what, we'll start with the green. Why not? It's as good a color as any. That was a lie. What? I actually did not choose green randomly. I knew that the background on this painting had a lot of green on it. And when I do a paint by number, I really like to start with the background colors. I feel like once you get the background done, then you can really focus on whatever the main character is. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but whenever I do a paint by number, even though the box does show you what the end result should look like, I always feel like I'm solving a puzzle. Like, there's all these little puzzle pieces on the canvas, and I'm looking at the little boxes and going, ooh, what color is that supposed to be? Let me mix these two numbers together. What color is that? And then slowly but surely, you're putting together a puzzle. Just me? Now this right here is an ugly color combination. It's like a really gross yellow. <laughs> Paint by Number is one of my all-time favorite types of art kits for three reasons. The first reason is it's a classic. It's one of those things that you can just always do and it's always fun. Reason number two is it's quite relaxing and thoughtless. I can sit, put on a movie, and have a great time and not really think about what I'm painting. I look at the number on the canvas, I look at the number on the little paint pot, and then I paint it. There's not a whole lot of brain power required. Reason number three is that when I do a paint by number, it's like a miracle happens. I'm painting all of these random little boxes, and at the end, I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, my eyes. It's the only paint kit I can think of where I look at the end result and I go, wow. This is truly miraculous, and I have no idea how I did it. We're now entering the phase of the paint by number where everything starts to come together and you start to really see a jungle scene with some tigers. Paint by number by nature a lot of times is very impressionistic. There's a lot of random blobs and stuff, but at the end when you look at it, especially from a distance, it looks crazy. And I don't even think I did the best job here ever. I went pretty fast and it still looks crazy. I don't even know how this is possible. It's amazing. I love paint by number. Okay, so here we have the window pane art kit. Well, I guess it's technically not a kit because I lost all of the paints. I had to mix together some clear glue and some acrylic paint in order to create my own paints. This window pane kit is definitely one of my older kits. I definitely got it in the early 2000s, and by now, all of those paints are probably dried out, and they're definitely lost. I decided to start off with the blue paint because I wanted to start with the sky. You'll notice that this window pane art has a bunch of butterflies all over it. My nemeses are present. Well, 
I think we all know at this point that I am afraid of real life butterflies, but cartoon butterflies are cute. We are allowed to like those in the Bellamina house. I mixed together this yellow glue paint because I wanted those little stripey things to look like rays of sunshine. I was looking at them and I was like, what the heck is this supposed to be? And if that's a sky, I guess those are sunshine rays. After that, I dipped into some of my purple glue paint. I'm just gonna call it glue paint from now on. I don't think that's the technical term for it. But I did Google how you're supposed to make paint that is somewhat transparent. It seemed like the internet's consensus was to mix clear glue and a little bit of acrylic paint and you should get a stained glass window pane art type of paint. But I'm just gonna call it glue paint because it's easier. I'm a big fan of this type of art kit as well. I had a lot of fun filling this out. I feel like the colors are really fun and bright. And most importantly, before we can say we like it, we have to have it pass the stained glass window pane art test. It's a test I just made up right now, but it has to be see-through. And as you can see, it is. Do not bend. Aggressive, but I'm interested. Inside the blue package was a white package. Inside the white package was very old shrinky dinks. I can see why it said do not bend. I can't say for sure, but the packaging seems like this is actually from the 1970s. Vintage. It, honestly, testing vintage art kits would be a good art series. Maybe I'll do that too. As you can see, I really enjoyed all of the vintage drawings on the back. This handsome young man being my favorite, obviously. Growing up, I certainly used Shrinky Dinks quite a bit, so I thought I knew what to expect. But when I opened this and saw a funhouse mirror, I quickly realized that this was something totally different. Kind of. It's not so different, but the pages for the Shrinky Dink are clear, like totally see-through and shiny on both sides. Typically, the Shrinky Dinks that I used growing up had a side that was rougher and you could use with colored pencils. This one did not work with anything other than permanent markers. It actually said that in the directions, I just missed it at first. I do have Sharpies that have a bunch of different colors, but I'm currently between different locations and they were not with me. But I did have my blue and black Sharpies. Since this material seemed to be about 50 years old by my approximation, I did want to do a test case. First thing I realized was it was really hard to cut this without it cracking. I also wanted to test if this would shrink in the same way we expect modern shrinky dinks to shrink. Into the toaster oven we go, and this did not disappoint. It turns out kids in the 1970s also got to look inside their oven and say, wow, look at this thing shrinking. Aside from the obvious crack in its neck, the only other problem with this was that I used such a dark Sharpie. So I went to the store and bought myself some ink permanent markers. They came in a bunch of different rainbow neon colors, which are my favorite. Let's try this again. I thought that our blue cat needed some redemption, so I decided to redraw it in a lighter blue color. These Sharpies do dry a darker color than I was anticipating, but I feel like this is an improvement from the cat with the severed head, so. I also tried to draw a small cat loaf. You know, when cats sit with their legs underneath their body and they look like a loaf. I wish I left it like this, but I was really second guessing myself in the moment and I felt like, you know what, this doesn't look like a cat loaf at all. It needs some legs. I added the legs and then I looked at it for a while, outlined it in black, outlined our blue cat in black, and then I went back and said, hmm, maybe this is a baby lamb? I don't know, I feel like she could have been a cat, but the tail makes it a lamb. It's all very confusing, but we're going to shrink these in the Shrinky Dink oven. Just kidding, that's a toaster oven. I like them, but honestly, it's really hard to color evenly with permanent marker. Because I wasn't satisfied with these two, I decided to draw one more thing with the Shrinky Dinks. My biggest complaint is actually that both sides of the paper are glossy. The glossiness makes it so that you can only use a permanent marker to color on this. And I don't really like using permanent markers to color things. I feel like they're not really meant for that. Permanent markers tend to be very streaky, they don't blend, and it just doesn't create a product 
that I like. <laughs> As you can see, I decided to draw two lovebirds. On the left, we have a somewhat irritated bird, and on the right, we have one that is squawking. <coughs> because I felt like the one on the left looked a little bit too angry for lovebirds, I decided to remove the angry eyebrow and just give it no eyebrow whatsoever. So now we have two lovebirds. The one on the left is very calm, and the one on the right is squawking very loudly. We did have some issues when I tried to shrink it. It kind of shrunk up on itself. I had to maneuver things, and I didn't quite get it to be as flat. I thought this was so interesting. I know that these Shrinky Dinks did not come out as good as it might have come out if I used a modern pack of Shrinky Dink paper, but I think it was really fun and cool to learn how other people in the past used to use Shrinky Dinks. Up next, we have a sand art kit, Dinosaur Scenes. This is a little different than what you're thinking. It actually is a peel and stick kind of thing, where you peel it off, there's stickers, and then you... Oh, this sand dumped everywhere. It was kind of a mess. As I was saying, these are scenes that have stickers. You peel them off and pour the sand that they give you on top of it. This art kit looks like it's from the 90s based on the packaging. I had a lot of art kits in the early 2000s. I was born in 94, but I mean, by the time I was like six or seven, you know, when you're actually using art kits, it's the early 2000s for me. This, I never used or saw anything like this. I'm not saying it didn't exist, but I never used it. So my guess is that this is an early 90s art kit. I think this is actually a lot of fun. It is a little bit messy, so you do need some kind of box or place to put the sand so you're not like getting sand everywhere. It's kind of like an equivalent of glitter. Glitter was my mother's natural enemy because apparently I was obsessed with it and got it everywhere. Sand could also be a mother's natural enemy, so I would say put it in a box or on something that you can easily get rid of. I only mention that because I feel like sometimes we do have some clean perfectionists out there. I personally am not one of those people. I've went over this. I'm vaguely a messy person. By my standards, I think I'm fine, but uh, some people think I'm messy. And I like to clean up afterwards, but I really try to embrace the mess of art while I'm doing it. So I didn't mind this at all. I actually had a lot of fun. The only thing I could see the potential for people feeling a little upset by this art kit is it's kind of hard to be precise when you're pouring the sand. You can see I tried to get fancy here and like do different lines and things, but it really is very hard to be very specific with it. It's more of an abstract art form and it's more about just like having fun and pouring sand rather than creating like this crazy masterpiece, if you know what I mean. A miracle occurred, I poured the sand and an eyebrow appeared. He's so cute, I love him. And here's what the final thing turned out looking like. I love this one. Maybe I'm just being biased, but look at his face. He's so cute. I do also enjoy the way the T-Rex scene turned out. I was trying to make it look like the asteroids were hitting or whatever the heck happened to the dinosaurs. I don't know. I wasn't a dinosaur kid. I don't know. If you are interested in getting a peel and stick sand art kit, apparently it is a thing right now. You can definitely buy those. Okay, let's move on to the next art kit. Let's open up this mysterious packaging. The first thing is actually not an art kit. It's a squishy pen, which is really cool. Thank you for sending this. I love it. The other thing is a sketching made easy art kit. It looks like Teresa has already started this by drawing a seahorse. This art kit comes with six different pencils that have different values. So they go from dark to light. The purpose of this art kit is really to have you do some drawing exercises using pencils that have very dark values and very light values. I believe the art kit referred to the pencils that have a darker value as having a thicker lead and the pencils that have a softer lead are the softer colors. I don't know if you can tell by the way I'm talking about this, but I don't really do this at all. I don't even own pencils that have dark and light values. So this is something that is definitely new for me and a challenge, but I was up for the challenge. I saw that seahorse and I said, you know what? I am going to sketch this as best as I possibly can. And I wanted it to look like a realistic sketch of a seahorse 
once I got the initial sketching for the seahorse down, I tried to move to the leaves or seaweed and coral that you have drawn down here. I should have stopped there, but I decided, you know what, maybe we need some stuff in the background. I want it to look like the seahorse is really in water. And I honestly should have stopped after the bubbles, but I went too far. I got carried away and I started adding some water to the background. In the end, I went off camera and erased some of the background, and this is what we ended up with. I think it looks like fine, but I feel like it would have been better if I just did not add the water in the background, but oh well. So this art kit is a velvet door hanger. Velvet. We've got some markers on the back, but I don't know how old this is. I feel like the markers are gonna be dried out. Let's open it. Let me just really easily shake and dump this out. Here we go. Come on, get out. Okay. So there appear to be three different things in this. There's the markers on the back, which are actually stuck to this green thing. It's left some sticky residue that... It's unpleasant. That obviously was not going to work. I tried to wipe it off with a baby wipe, which obviously was not going to work either. I really should have used some alcohol swabs, but then I realized, you know what, the cat is covering it anyway. This is useless, let's just forget about it. I enjoy the velvet cat that comes with this. It's very cute. And then we have these markers, which I am very skeptical about because one, they are so small. They are literally the size of my pinky finger. So that's not pinky promising. All right, I'll stop. These are also the type of markers that when you look at them, you immediately know they are never going to work. The ink is almost immediately going to be dried out just because of the way that they look. You're like, yes, this is a, okay, these, look, the cap is not going to go on the back, Marissa. I started to use the red marker and surprise, surprise, it doesn't work. But I decided let's turn this into a fun little game, a battle, if you will. Nothing like a little competition. Let's see which marker can go the furthest. The red lost immediately. The blue went kind of far, but the purple, oh my gosh, the purple. Look how far she went. She really flew. She could just keep going and then she, fi she finally put her now. But the pink was just horrible right from the start. The green really probably was probably the worst. And we have discovered what I already knew. I am going to need to use my own markers to be able to complete this art kit. I decided to take out my ink permanent marker set of these bright neon colors. These are actually a very fun permanent marker set. I enjoy these. I mean, I don't use them all the time, but they're kind of fun to use occasionally. I'm doing a swatch of all the colors I might use, and there are certain colors, like the orange, that just look really dark until they dry and then they start to look a little better. Some are not my favorite, some I really like, but you know what, we're gonna use it. Let's take our precious velvet cat back out. What should we name the cat, actually? It should be something to do with velvet, because this is a velvet coloring thing. Let me think, let me think, let me think, let me think. Velvet. Furry, soft, Velma. The cat's name is Velma. Okay, now we can move on. As you can see, I decided to color this cat this weird purple color at first because, well, there were not a lot of options that I liked and the light lavender purple just seemed like the best option. As I was coloring this, the velvet actually started to decay and disintegrate into pieces. It got everywhere and I looked back at the packaging, realized this is from 2009. It's not as old as my art kits, but they're pretty close, honestly. I think mine were around 2004, 2005-ish. This is 2009. We're approaching a 15-year-old art kit. I think it's allowed to disintegrate a tiny bit, but only a little. <laughs> I took out this darker magenta color and started doing some shading on Velma. And the purple magenta kind of color combination was weird, but when I started to do the shading and then added the darker shading to the eyes. That's when things started to look really scary to me. I was like, wow, this cat has seen some stuff. It also kind of reminds me of the Cheshire cat colors. And I was like, wow, was not intending that, but I guess that was an accident. Moving down to our fish bowl that has a goldfish inside it. It looks like Velma is proudly protecting her goldfish. 
potentially proudly presenting her goldfish. I know cats do like to eat fish typically, but I like to think that Velma and this goldfish are friends and she will not eat it. As I was coloring in the goldfish area, things started to get a bit muddy. I don't know why this happened, but I guess the velvet, the black started to like melt into some of my colors and that is why things look a little bit bad. Velma is going to have a yellow bow and then there are these paw prints around her so I'm coloring them in with three different colors yellow, blue, and green. The shading on Velma's bow is orange as well so I chose those colors because that is the same colors that are in the goldfish bowl. After that I took out my jelly roll white pen and added some extra highlights to the eyes. Tried to make it look not so scary. I also took out this cream Posca paint pen and added that to the top part of the fishbowl just so we had some color there. And I used my jelly roll for some bubbles in the fishbowl. I felt like my cat needed some extra pizzazz. We already had some ridiculous colors going on here, so I figured why not add some yellow highlights to the cat it kind of makes it look a little bit orange, and I think that brings in the goldfish really well. It's just a fun thing to have. I don't know. Okay, so here we have our very eccentric and colorfully colored cat. And if you thought this was over, it's not. We still have to handle our door hanger, the green thing that came with this kit. On the top part of the door hanger, the part that has the circle where the door knob goes, I think we all know how this works. I decided to write Bellamina because this is presumably going to go on the door to my art room. I may as well have my channel name written on the top of it. I'm also taking out my gross looking hot glue gun so that I can glue our cat to the door hanger. After Velma the Velvet Cat has been glued to the door hanger, I'm taking out different Posca paint pens to decorate around that. The colors I used at first were a little too light, so I decided to go back over them with some darker colors, and I'm creating, like, confetti, I guess. My goal here was to incorporate some of the colors that are on the cat onto the background. After that's done, I wanted to seal everything together, so I took out my Mod Podge gloss finish and sprayed a hefty amount on top of the door hanger. I think I did two or three sprays of it. I did so many coats of the Mod Podge spray because I felt like the velvet was coming off of the green plastic and I didn't want things to fall apart. So I just sprayed a ton of Mod Podge on it and it was very sealed together. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate you guys still supporting me even though I am taking a break from YouTube. I recently had a baby and then went back to work and I just, I need a bit of a break. So I'm doing my dream of combining my series into one video while I am taking this much needed break. I'll see you guys next week for another video. Bye.